and it's 1 p.m., so it's time to do 55 minutes around the world of business. It only happens at Business Incorporated. Here's what we have for you on the program today. With reports of just 30,000 tractors in Nigeria, we delve into the situation of mechanized farming in the country. And soon, this year, later on this year, Africa Energy Bank is set to begin. And if you are interested in investing in Egypt, T-bills, that's treasury bills, are open for sale. The auction opens today. Welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwad. Usual, we'll start from the global space. Uh, beginning with oil prices, it's edged up on Thursday following two consecutive sessions of decline as investors reassess the latest data on U.S. crude oil and gasoline inventories and also return to buying mood. Uh, Brent's crude features for May were up 40 cents, that was 0.5 percent, at 86 dollars 49 cents a barrel, while the more actively traded June contracts rose 36 cents, 0.4 percent, to 85 dollars 77 cents. The May contract expires today, and the U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude features for May delivery were up 44 cents, that's about 0.5 percent to $81.79 a barrel. Both benchmarks were on track to finish higher for a third consecutive month and were up about 4.5% from last month in the prior session. Oil prices were pressured following last week's unexpected rise in U.S. crude oil and gasoline inventories driven by a rise in crude imports and sluggish gasoline uh, demand, according to traders. Still in the global space, Chicago soybeans, uh, corn and wheat dipped on Thursday as traders brace for quarterly grain stocks and planting intention report from the United States Department of Agriculture are supposed to be out later on today. They also expect the U.S. corn and wheat plantings to fall in 2024, while soybean plantings increase. These USDA report always presents volatility risks for grain markets since the outcomes are often unpredictable. The most active soybean contract on the Chicago Board of Trade was down 0.1% at $11.91 a bushel, while CBOT, that's the Chicago Board of Trade wheat, fell also 0.1% to $5.47 for a quarter of a bushel. Corn slipped 0.1% to $4.26 for half a bushel. Still staying in commodity space now, gold prices steadied on Thursday as investors digested comments from Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller on interest rate cuts and looked forward to more U.S. economic data for policy clues. Spot gold was flat at $2,194.36 per ounce, while U.S. gold features edged up 0.2% to $2,193.90. Fed Governor Waller on Wednesday said that recent disappointing inflation data affirms the case for the U.S. Central Bank holding off on cutting its short-term interest rate target. Spot silver was steady at $24.67 per ounce. Platinum rose 0.7% to $900.35 and palladium climbed 1.3% to $996.19 per ounce. We come to Nigeria, where the National Pension Commission reports that despite the perceived growth of pension assets uh, in the country, in Naira terms, the real value has dropped by 56% to $14.4 billion, down from $33.3 billion. This is at uh, January 2024. However, in local currency, this value experienced a growth of 30%. Uh, during the same period from 14.99 uh, trillion naira as of January 31st, 2023 to 19.53 trillion naira as of January 31st, 2024. This is because of the changes in the exchange rate regime, which has pitched the local currency against the U.S. dollar uh, for this period. Pencom notes 
that the net value of the country's pension fund asset uh, dropped to $14 billion at the end of January, down from $33.3 billion about 12 months earlier. Still in Nigeria, the rate of increase in deposit money banks' credits to the private sector slowed by 5% in February 2024 from 22% in January 2024, according to data from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Credit to the private sector grew on a slowing rate to 80.86 trillion naira as of February 2024, compared to 76 0.29 trillion naira in January. The slow pace of credit to the private sector follows monetary policy tightening by the central bank, uh, which I remember on Tuesday, our uh, rate was hiked by 200 basis points to 24.75. The monetary policy convened before yesterday, February 26, 20, and 27, and unanimously increased the NPR by 400 basis points to 22.75. One other hot topic in Nigeria is the Naira it continues to gain against the dollar, uh, giving some comfort and hitting a six-week high of 1,300 at the close of trade on Wednesday. That's March the 28th. Economists are calling for caution to that excitement anyways. The chief executive officer of financial derivatives company, Mr. Bismarck Rowani, was a guest on Business Morning earlier with Ladi Williams. And he believes that the fair value of the Naira can only be achieved when forex supply comes from export instead of the current factor, which is uh, interventions from the Central Bank of Nigeria. The corporate theorem in economics which means that uh, prices always move and exaggerate themselves in the wrong direction. So <clears throat> was it natural for the Naira to fall from 800 to 1,900? No, I think that was exaggerated. So what we are seeing now is a correction and a point of inflection where the Naira is coming back towards its fair value. So what, is the currency misaligned? Yes, it is misaligned. Is it getting back towards fair value? Yes. Is it, is it running ahead of itself? I think it is. I think this appreciation is, is being overdone, it will, come, it, will, it will normalize very soon. So don't get carried away by the fact that it's going to go to God knows what. I think stable rates should be at about 1,300, 1,400 for now. And then we see how things happen because the, it's all about supply. The supply is not there yet right now, but that's not being worked upon. So basically, like I said on your program the other day, sanitization of the market, liberalization of the market, price discovery, and then increase supply, and then you see stability to it around fair value. So for now, it's good. For one thing, people are not rushing to buy dollars that they don't need, <clears throat> which was part of the problem. Two, people now believe that whatever goes up will come down to normal. A word of caution there from Mr. Bismarck Rowani. Now let's look at another issue, food security. Well, the level of Nigeria's agricultural mechanization is among the lowest globally. This is according to the National Agricultural Technology and Innovation Policy for 2022 to 2027. Uh, this, it was published on the website of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Considering 70 million hectares of arable land in the country, demanding mechanization activities needs not less than 1 million tractors. Unfortunately, reports say it's just about 30,000 in the country at this time. Uh, we do not have uh, current numbers to confirm or refute that report to say if it's just 30,000 tractors. But we do know that uh, there's a death of uh, mechanized equipment for farming in the country. Well, let's talk to someone who is active in that sector. Perhaps we can get a clearer picture uh, uh, this afternoon. The managing director of BD Acres Limited, he's Dr. Dalhatu Hamza, joins us from our Abuja studio. Uh, Dr. Hamza, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Um, good afternoon, Annie. So, um, I, we, I did see reports saying that we have just about 30,000 tractors. I want to believe that's not true, perhaps that's an old number. What, from your perspective, would be an average number, if we can, of tractors, or at least the equipment that we need for mechanized farming in the country? Um, actually, tractors are just the baseline in terms of mechanization in agriculture. 
we actually also need um, a land preparation equipment, which is basically the, the, the best thing that can ever happen to our food security sector or agricultural sector in Nigeria. At the moment, I don't have any statistics, but actually the availability of tractor in the country is really scanty in the sense that, and most of those tractors available in Nigeria are not really standard tractors. Recently, I think two states in the Federation have actually taken a lead or are in the roadmap of taking the lead on mechanization in agriculture, and that is Niger and Yobe State. Um, uh, the Niger State uh, governor recently launched his mechanization scheme where Mr. President went and launched it about two weeks ago. Um, the food security uh, program of His Excellency, the President uh, of Nigeria, uh, President Ahmed uh, Bola Tinubu, can only be achieved if mechanization is actually taken more seriously. Um, the Federal Minister of Agriculture recently sent a delegation to Turkey and at an expo uh, on mechanization and we have several sizes of tractors and other equipment such as harvesters, planters, and uh, treasures that are essential in achieving um, agricultural mechanization. Um, let me give an instance where you want to start the rainy season uh, farming soon. Our land preparation our land preparation generally is key to, um, to farming and high yield and subsequently for security. At the moment, that is almost absent in Nigeria. We need harrowers, we need tillers, we need plows, we need land clearing equipment in the country. At the moment, very few, if any, except probably some few uh, private farmers that own this equipment. So, um, we, we, like you said, there, there are programs and policies. And of course, every state does have Ministry of Agriculture. Um, even here on, on channels, we've talked about um, how some private sectors, you know, try to make that their own investment and business into all of this. But in spite of all of that, we have uh, numbers here saying that hand tool technology is about 70 to 90 percent. So we still have a lot of subsistence farming. Um, we have uh, the cultivated land by drought, animal power is about 10 to 25 percent, while mechanical power is about 5 to 15 percent so obviously um, we do need capital um, apart from the problem of insecurity in the country we do need capital in this area uh, and we hear a lot of programs like the ones you have named but we still don't seem to get the effect or are we too much in a hurry expecting there to be results from some of those policies um, now let me say at this stage that the federal government uh, agricultural policy is the most excellent policy ever designed for the country. But the fact is that a subsistence farmer cannot easily afford uh, mechanized equipment. There must be a concerted effort. I remember at one time we were trying to um, uh, actualize the cluster system of agriculture in the country. That has not been achieved in the past. But the way forward for mechanization at the moment is a cluster system of agriculture where you bring in together a cohort of farmers with common product and they produce massively in a large scale of land on a commercial, sustainable, and all year round uh, farming where you can deploy as much mechanized equipment as possible. Even if it is on a rental basis, the government intervention is key at this point. Mm. 
Would you say that should be from the local or the state government to organize this cluster farming? It should be at all levels, from the local farmer in the village where uh, they can be organized. Already, a lot of uh, farmer association exists in the country, and they actually go down to the grassroots level, which they need to do more. For example, I know the Maize Association of Nigeria, the Ginger Farmers Association, just to mention a few, uh, CSM Seed Association and the rest. They need to go down to the grassroots and organize them more. Um, last week, to be precise, on Friday, the Tomato Association held uh, a, 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 a national conference for the first time. And uh, we did a white paper for them and suggested to them that they should actually uh, go into the grassroots and organize uh, farmers uh, at various levels to enhance uh, commercial scale and attracting industries in the tomato industry. Another thing about uh, mechanization is um, 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 what you call um, irrigation system. Irrigation systems allow you to actually do more than one cropping uh, season in a year. And that is very key to what uh, food security can achieve in the country, especially now that the federal government is giving all it can to make sure that Nigeria is not left behind in terms of food availability. What about the private sector? Isn't there a way the private sector can help uh, accelerate this, especially when we talk about going down to the grassroots? Although I do know the private sector will be more, you know, uh, driven by profits, which can be a deterring factor for uh, those at uh, the lower side of the, of the ladder. Yeah, the, the private sector actually are key. In fact, they are supposed to take a lead even before, before the government uh, intervention, because um, farming is profitable, no matter how you look at it. But you have to take it at commercial level. If you take farming at commercial level, it's highly profitable. So the, and, and, but also, I would like to mention that our banks, our commercial banks in Nigeria are not, and I repeat that, I, are not actually assisting the local farmer or both private uh, and, and, and the grassroots level to actually enhance uh, his, uh, his farming methods and also see it as a business. The banks need to do more. Yesterday, we had a meeting by chance with one of the banks. I wouldn't mention the bank, but I'm sure they're hearing me. And we talked with the topmost management and told them that they need to look at farming as a venture because they just collect money and lock it up in the bank. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to the country. They need to participate actively. And each bank now in Nigeria has so-called agricultural officers that go around, I don't know what they do. Because we have not improved the way we do farming today in the country. We need to do more. The bank need to come up, they need to wake up, they need to work up to their responsibility in terms of agricultural intervention uh, in the country. Mm. And on top of all of this, we, we are still dealing with uh, the shortage of FX. I, I don't know. I do know that um, uh, there was a young man in Plateau State some years ago who makes some of this farm equipment. But most of it will be imported into the country, and that poses another challenge. Uh, for this uh, population of tractors and other equipment in the agriculture sector? Um, well, actually, uh, we have a lot of local fabricators, and they do help a lot. But when you're talking of importation of agricultural uh, input equipment for mechanization of our uh, agricultural sector, the government has a policy of 5% uh, uh, charges on agricultural uh, equipment. Um, it's a bit difficult. It, it needs to be more uh, 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 simplified 
so that, so that people who are into this sector can find it much more easier to bring in the right equipment into the country. But also we have an opportunity, particularly in Turkey, where we're talking with a lot of companies that are very willing to either come here and set up their assemblage, but and also train uh, our local uh, uh, experts or skills to, to help in the driving of mechanization in the country. All right, uh, Dr. Dalhatu Hamza, Managing Director of BDA Cast Limited. Thank you so much. And this is a conversation we will continue pushing until we get uh, food security in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to the market as well as other conversations right here on Business Incorporated. Just stay with us. We'll come back, we head to the markets now and see what those numbers are telling us at intraday. Beginning with Nigeria, we always have to begin from home. They say charity begins at home. So we see a sustained uh, positive sentiment at the NGX for this afternoon intraday. We see that the NGX, uh, well, it's so slight very risky 0.01 percent uh, up at intraday we're still on our 104,289.50 for south africa it's also green 0.40 percent and uh, south africa since uh, regained that 73,000 uh, it's known for and even went up to 74,000 so 74,202.34 at the uh, at intraday egypt is however on the flip side and it's really red 0.76 percent but Egypt's economy has been enjoying a whole lot of attention uh, in recent days since they got that loan from IMF even though we see um, taxes uh, uh, increasing but we see that the pound is uh, gaining value after that uh, arrangement or with and um, UAE. So uh, it, it's looking good, but as we know, in every market, there will always be a period of profit taking. So I guess that's what we have at this time 0.76% uh, down for uh, Egypt. Kenya closed yesterday positive 0.46%. And I think we need to celebrate a little bit for Kenya. Uh, we've seen this struggle, struggle under the 100 level for a bit. Now it's up 117.78 for Kenya. Good news. And uh, we know profit taking will also come one way or the other. But let's enjoy what we have now uh, at this time. Going to other markets now, Middle East. We see Middle East as intraday is in the red. 9,266.13 uh, down 0.08 percent for the Middle East. Dubai uh, is on the flip side, 0.29% at 4,244 uh, right there. Looking at other markets, Saudi Arabia is red also, 12,564.42, lost 0.35% and Qatar is also in the red. Uh, not as much as Saudi Arabia, but it's 9,943.61 at uh, intraday let's go to other markets now in asia uh, a sea of red we'll see there at least for the first two markets uh, uh nikkei uh, sustaining it 40,000, but of course there has to be profit taking somewhere in between so we see it i uh, lost 1.46 but in spite of that loss, you see still looking good. The numbers are still looking good. After it hit its new high about a month ago at 38,000, it's been growing steadily on that. Kospi is in the red, 0.34%, 2,745.82. Hang Seng index is almost 1% uh, gain at the close of trade. Beautiful picture right there at uh, 16,000 more. And Shanghai is green, 0.59%. In Australia also, this is even more beautiful than what we had right there. Imagine it's just one move and then it gets to 1%. It's difficult to see a market gain a whole 1% in one session. But that's what Australia has done at the close of trade today. Now we move to the United States and see the features number, features number red. Red right here for Dow Jones, 0.03% in the red. S&P 500 also in the red, 0.12%. And Nasdaq, 0.21% at the close of, um, for the features, 
uh, of uh, the U.S. And we know that uh, they're looking forward to that, uh, those CP numbers, uh, to see where, of course, the market will react to it at the close of trade. All right, so that's it for the market. Let's head to London now. Juliana is standing by. Juliana, uh, good afternoon. Um, well, I, I do hear, I did hear that the chief executive of Thames Water has refused to rule out bill increases. We talked about the plan uh, on energy the other day, even though we couldn't get the details, Juliana did tell us that the details were yet to be revealed, uh, you know, but, uh, so I think now it's revealed, but let's hold on for a bit. We'll get Juliana to give us the details of both the water bills and the energy bills in a couple of minutes. For now, let's move to Berlin and see uh, what's making the news right there in Berlin and uh, what we see uh, fr from Berlin uh, is uh, where we have Cassandra joining us today, uh, not the last that we've been having all through the week. Uh, what Cassandra's uh, story today is talking about, um, there we go, just a minute. Yeah. So, so in, um, in the EU, they're considering a radical change to how they fund poor members. As we know, the EU has 20, 27 uh, nations coming together as one, and they call it cohesion funding. Well, they want to make some changes to that, uh, and they're looking at an estimated 392 billion euros. That's a lot of money, but may not be so much when you consider that there are 27 nations involved. But, well, we have Cassandra to give us the details. Hi, Cassandra. Good afternoon. So, uh, what's this change for? Why now? Thanks for having me, Annie. Yeah, this is basically changing the cohesion fund to a performance-based funding mechanism. You noted that really big number before. The fund is worth 392 billion euros, and that's just for the period between 2021 and 2027. Now, to put this into perspective, that fund alone is about one quarter of the EU's budget for that period, and this reform would basically attach strings to the funding for the first time. Now, the proposed model takes some notes from the rule attached to the EU's post-pandemic cash fund. Basically, under that scheme, Brussels linked cash transfers to the adoption of domestic reforms, and it aimed to reward progress along the way. Now, that didn't always go smoothly, with the post-COVID cash transfers being basically covered with red tape due to the strict audits and controls. Now, all of the bloc's 27 commissioners signed off on the document with the proposed reforms yesterday, uh, which agreed on some criteria, and that report from the commission says that it hopes that a cash for reforms model would potentially accelerate, quote, financial implementation. But there would still have to be a formal proposal as part of the next seven-year budget, which would come into force in 2028. So uh, what are the kind of reforms that they think can suit this 27 nations that are in different levels or status of economy? Well, in recent years, the European Union has struggled to persuade some members to stick to democratic standards. They've even withheld funding, but only in some really limited ways. Namely, here we are talking about Hungary and Poland. So making this kind of cohesion financing dependent on reforms right from the start could make it easier to keep member states from tilting into full-fledged anti-democratic states. But this isn't just about problems with countries that are already within the fold of the European Union. The EU has a membership roadmap for several West Balkan countries like Albania and Macedonia, but also on the table is a potential membership for Ukraine. Then uh, let's head to the market now, see how that's doing at this time. Well, Eurozone bond yields are up slightly. This comes after a signal from a Federal Reserve governor over in the U.S. that he plans to advocate for a, quote, higher for longer rate strategy. But all of that is pending some inflation data that is due in the next several days. France, Italy, and the U.S. will release inflation figures on Friday, while Germany and the euro area wide figures are due this week, this upcoming week. But besides the bonds, traders will look to see if that near record high that European stocks saw yesterday yesterday continues to today. One of the top performers was Sweden's H&M. The world's second largest fashion retailer saw a 15% surge yesterday. That was a big boost to the retail sector, which ended up 2.5%.
Yeah, quite detailed there, Cassandra. Thank you so much for that. And let's head to that London studio where Juliana is standing by now. We're talking about water and energy, two very important uh, factors in living, daily living. So, Juliana, good afternoon. We hear that, that the Chief Executive Officer of Thames uh, is not able to come well confirm uh, uh, if there's been increase or not for customers, obviously in the prices. That's absolutely right, um, Inni. Good afternoon. There's uh, Britain's biggest water company, Thames Water, is in big uh, trouble. And in fact, they've been locked. The bosses have been locked in a crisis meeting for several days now involving a large swathe of individuals, including representatives from the British government, off what, which is the water regulator, as well as investors. And that's because um, I believe the firm is in debt to the tune of about 18 billion pounds. Now, you remember last year, Inni, that the British government actually had to inject uh, their own funds, I believe about half um, um, a billion pounds to ensure that they were able to stay afloat. And they have, but there remains persistent issues. I do believe um, some sort of deal was agreed um, with investors yesterday to inject even more liquid into the firm, but that had many concessions um, about regulation. And that is why Ofwat are in discussions with bosses today, because they, do, they don't believe that they are going to be able to concede on some of those environment issues. Um, any of our viewers that are watching from London know that it's quite typical these days uh, to see some roads flooded. And this is because of Thames Water and the fact that they've got themselves into so much trouble over the past few years that's built into this crisis. Now, it is private, of course, it was privatised in the 80s, and there are suggestions that perhaps the British taxpayer will have to take back on um, some of these burdens. Now, the big issue this morning, you mentioned the CEO, um, Innie, who only stepped in in January, actually, so he's walked into a firestorm and it's been none of his doing. Uh, but the suggestion to save the company and bring down some of this debt was to perhaps increase water bills by 40% from 2025. And of course, with the cost of living crisis, albeit slowing down, it's just something that the British government will know that it's just going to be completely unaffordable. Um, and the regulator has stepped in to say, no, not 40% pay rise. So again, lots of conversation still going on. Emergency crisis talks, perhaps there'll be an update before the break for the Easter weekend. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, another important one is the energy. We talked about this uh, last week, I believe, but we didn't have the details. Now, households are being asked to submit meter readings. Do we have the details now of how the billing is going to look like? We, we have, yes, yeah, so you're right. We did have the discussion, didn't we, about um, off gem, which is the energy uh, regulator. And they were talking about the energy price cap, which has been in place for about five years. But it really became a major talking point because we needed it. We were relying on it during uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which made... Britain's energy security really fragile. At one point, the energy price cap was at £4,000. We would have been paying £4,000 a year for our energy bills, if not for the fact that we had that energy price cap guarantee, which was basically government funding to ensure that we didn't all uh, become bankrupt. Um, but so the energy price cap is falling again. It's going to fall from the quarter from April. And what um, the regulator is urging households to do before this weekend is to check their meter. Now, what happens in this country is that most of the time, energy companies, they estimate how much energy you are using. You have a phone call or they look at previous bills. The problem is the energy price cap has been going up and down. It's so sporadic that um, the British government and the regulator want to ensure that your bills are not being guessed because you could be saving up to £400 a year. So that is the urgent warning that um, they've put out this morning that please, 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 if you're watching from the UK, it's worth, it's only going to take a couple of seconds, just check, phone your supplier and you can get um, a discount at the end of the year. Yeah, sounds like uh, the postpaid system in Nigeria's energy too. But anyway, let's head to the market now. How's that looking? I hope it brings some brightness to your faces. It's the final trading day before the Easter holiday.
That's right. It is the final trading day and uh, the UK blue chip index has yo-yoed this week, but it is going to end the week, we think. There's still a couple of hours left to trade, uh, but it could be ending on a high. The all share is up. It's up 0.32% to 100 is up by 0.35% in the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 0.02%. In the currencies market, the British pound is trading down against the US dollar by 0.04%, though up against the euro by 0.20% and up against the Japanese yen by 0.03%. In a. Thank you, Juliana, and uh, I guess I'll see you on the other side of the Easter holiday. Definitely. Have a lovely Easter. <laughs> All right, see. Now let's head to South Africa. Yesterday I spoke to my colleague Innocent Semosa. The meeting was still on as at the time we had that conversation. Uh, that's the Monetary Policy Committee meeting. And uh, uh, well, by the time they made the announcement, the program was over. So uh, he sent in this report uh, telling us what the decision was. But I can tell you that the Monetary Policy Committee once again kept the repo rage uh, rate on change at 8.25%. Uh, this is the fifth consecutive hold by the central bank. Details in this report by our correspondent Innocent Semusa. The South African Reserve Bank has cited a positive inflation outlook as the reason to keep interest rates unchanged at 8.25%, making this the fifth hold since May last year. The MPC decided to hold the repo rate unchanged at 8.25%. The decision was unanimous. At this level of raise, the policy stance is considered restrictive. Despite a jump in the consumer price index from 5.3% in January to 5.6% last month, the sub has once again kept the repo rate unchanged. Meanwhile, the General Industry Workers Union of South Africa strongly opposed this announcement. As we have said previously, this decision reflects the gulf that separates the horrendous nightmare that is a life of the masses of the working class and the middle class people, and the paradise in policies inhabited by the Monetary Policy Committee and the predatory financial elite that they serve. The current interest rates that the Reserve Bank maintains has had a devastating impact on the lives of ordinary people. The question is, how does the decision to keep the repo rate unchanged at 8.25% reflect the current state of South Africa's economy, particularly in light of its challenges and recent developments? Economist Elna Mulman explains. The Reserve Bank kept interest rates on hold despite the weakness in the economy. The SARP's approach at this stage is really just to argue that inflation is still somewhat elevated towards the um, ceiling of its inflation target and the inflation risks are still quite significant. And so if we get towards the second half of the year and these inflation risks don't materialize, there could be some scope for the Reserve Bank to provide a little bit of monetary policy relief. But we should really think of this just at, as marginal relief. In other words, at most 100 basis points of interest rate cuts. The key growth constraints at this stage are really coming from the infrastructure side, so electricity and logistical infrastructure constraints. And it is the extent to which we can sustainably and convincingly address these constraints that will ultimately determine our medium-term growth potential. The bank is only expected to start its rate-cutting cycle in the third quarter of this year. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. Well, it seems like uh, rate cutting is close, closer to the horizon in South Africa than Nigeria, seeing that they have now five consecutive hold position. Well, Nigeria hasn't gotten there yet, but let's keep pushing and uh, our own brightness will come soon. Now let's uh, look at Africa, Africa Energy Bank. Uh, the proposed Africa Energy Bank, which is supposed to focus on investment in oil and gas projects across the continent, is set to start operations later on this year with an initial $5 billion authorized capital base. The bank uh, 
a partnership between Afrexim Bank and the African Petroleum Producers Organization, APPO, is meant to help plug a, a funding gap on the continent amid pressure on major banks from environmental groups to shift investment dollars away from climate warming oil and gas projects. It's envisaged that each African member country will contribute a minimum of $83 million for a total of around $1.5 billion, while Afrexim and APOS founder members uh, are expected to match this amount. Uh, next, we go to Egypt, where we see that the Central Bank of Egypt has auctioned uh, T-bills worth 60 billion Egyptian pounds. So if you're looking for investment, this might be a good place. This is open today in coordination with the Ministry of Finance uh, to a CBA statement uh, on their website. This, was, this has been made available. The auctions are being offered in two tranches, uh, 35 billion pounds for 180 day to be matured on uh, the first of October 2024 and another 25 billion pounds for 364 day I will mature on the 1st of uh, April next year Treasury bills are short-term government debt instrument with maturities ranging from three months to a year. Well, I guess I should add that at this time, the securities in Nigeria are really attractive and might be a good place to look out for if you are interested and patient enough for a year and 182 days uh, to invest your money there. And then from there we go to Uganda where the Ugandan president Yoweri Museveni has officially launched national operations of the country's first interest-free commercial Islamic bank, allowing it to operate following Islamic principles. Mr. Museveni said at the launch ceremony for the Salam Bank in the capital Kampala that Islamic banking has the potential to significantly contribute to the development of Uganda's financial sector and attract more Muslims to invest in the country's economy. The government does not believe in discrimination and treats all Ugandans equally, regardless of religion or tribe. He said that uh, this attribution has allowed the country to develop uh, socially and economically. In September last year, the Bank of Uganda granted its first Islamic banking license to Salam Bank Uganda, a subsidiary of Djibouti-based bank, after parliament passed legislation authorizing Islamic banking, which Museveli signed into law. All right, now let's head to the crypto market and see how that's doing. Well, I don't know if you're counting down to halving yet, but Ladi has more information on that. Ladi, yesterday you had yeah, a sea of red. Down. Yeah, it's counting down. We started count counting down. down. Yeah, we're counting down to the okay, so um, halving. That's in April. And uh, definitely... April is just next week. It's just, yeah, exactly. So um, investors, um, definitely, we've seen so much speculation at this time. One thousand. What's going to happen? One thousand? No, 100,000. Exactly. Is some, have said 100, 000, some have said 100,000. Some have said $150,000, know, you know, What's your per Bitcoin. I don't have any projection <laughs> at this <laughs> time. My crystal I'm, ball I'm, is I'm really dusty. To say I'm just a reporter. Yeah, just a <laughs> bloody reporter. I don't know about as, that part. Aniete, you know, would say. <laughs> but now, yeah, from a sea of red yeah, yesterday, it's, um, yeah, green on the screen um, at this point. But there's some pockets of red um, at this time with uh, profit taking on um, likes of internet computer, that's ICP, Matic, and uh, some other uh, cryptocurrencies that we track on CoinMarketCap. If we look at the uh, top headlines um, this afternoon, we see Dogecoin, yeah, the king of the memes, that's the dog-themed um, meme uh, crypto coin there, jumped about 10% today. It's reclaimed that 20 cents um, level for the first time since um, December. Um, 2021. The meme coin uh, price bomb comes days after um, Twitter's artificial intelligence chatbot, that's Grok, um, told some users that Dogecoin payments on the platform were possible. I would see investors reacting to that. Um, also, we see Sam Backman free. Uh, we're going to get um, details on his sentencing. That's supposed to be um, today. Yeah, the poster boy, uh, the former poster boy of crypto. Um, we've heard some really tough. Uh, sentencing um, numbers at this point, some say about 50 years, and, uh, but we've seen his defense team recommend at least five to six years um, for what he did with FTX uh, funds, that's some user um, funds. Also, we see Google, they've integrated 
uh, Bitcoin data. Uh, recently, they made a significant stride in the cryptocurrency world by integrating Bitcoin data directly into its search engine. This um, holds a substantial implication for um, accessibility and visibility of Bitcoin. That's the leading um, cryptocurrency there. So we're seeing a lot of bullish news um, coming, but this is supposed to be uh, bearish as the Sam Bagman fried um, sentence, but we'll see how it impacts the market uh, going forward uh, at this time. Let's bring in Rume Ofi now, financial market analyst, uh, to bring us up speed. Uh, great to have you, Rume. Good afternoon, Ladi. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, Sam Backman Fried is supposed to get his uh, sentencing uh, details today. What are you expecting? Um, since uh, Bankman Fried has been in the uh, 40 to 50 years as well, worst case scenario, 30, the idea of six to five years, uh, I don't think holding water is right because the committed a huge crime. Uh, across board, that is so much for a young person to do. Sometimes I get really surprised when some persons try to give him uh, a soft landing, calling him a kid, made a mistake, blah, blah, blah. blah. In fact, I know a couple of persons here in Nigeria that lost a huge amount of money. Yeah, and that is, that is enough to destroy someone's life. So he needs to account for that by going to jail. That is uh, a huge financial misconduct here and there. It is not good for the industry, and this should serve as a lesson for everyone that are uh, actually just hopping into things that are, are too good to be true uh, in the crypto space. This is a new industry, and uh, anything is possible to happen while regulation is here to take its full cost. I think that is what I see for now, Ladi. Right, and how do you think this will, you know, shape um, other uh, CEOs that are that, that are leading some of these other top exchanges um, at this time? And what 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 are you expecting um, from regulation, from what we get from this sentence? Because 50 years is a long time, and he's about 32 years old right now. That will take him to about 80 uh, before he gets out of jail, if that actually um, happens. Well, how do you see this shaping regulation? In, especially for crypto exchanges, yeah, centralized crypto yeah, exchanges. So, yes, yeah, so crypto exchange platforms, their CEO should be ready, and they are most likely going to let and those of them that are into illicit transactions, piloting, fraudulent and, uh, or funds in their platform, they are obviously going to, if they will send shockwave to a lot of them, the other day you saw uh, KuCoin, uh, it has been accused, yeah, have been accused of piloting illicit transactions up to about uh, about two billion dollars or so. Uh, all of this is going to hit the market. Uh, you know that of Binance, they have actually uh, accepted to pay the fine about four point five. You know all of these that are happening. It seems this year is also going to be a year of regulation in some sort. But again, uh, it's not going to be regulation by strangulation. It's going to be regulation by enforcement because some of these persons. I've actually had, I've actually had their hands soiled in some of these uh, illicit way of uh, piloting transactions through the platform. Also, this also amounts to platforms here in our, in our, in our country, Nigeria, and also in our country in Africa. Anybody that has done transactions, they should be rest and sure that the Nigerian Security and Exchange Commission is going to also come for them. Also, those that are pushing name coins without facility and putting back doors where they can make it a wrong pool to, uh, to, to take people's money. The SEC, Nigeria SEC is going to come for you and they are going to smoke you out for you to pay for all of your wrongdoings. This is an industry wide things are supposed to be done well and things are going to be done well, hopefully, for the industry to mature forward. This is the beginning. A lot is going to happen, but this will stand as a different to all, everybody that is just think that all they want to do is just to win and not to do things right. Right. Uh, and talking about the, the meme coins, at this time we're already seeing in the UK, uh, talking about regulating uh, meme coins there. And, you know, if you're an influencer, you can't just come out there and tell your followers to buy, you know, some of these uh, meme coins by, you know, promoting it. But we're seeing them still rising price in the market. We're seeing Dogecoin. That's the king of the meme coins. It's up about 10% today. 
with what was hap what, what, with what happened on X, uh, with the artificial intelligence um, uh, thing that's saying that's Grok, you know, saying that payments are actually going to be allowed on, on the X platform with Dogecoin. So we're seeing big endorsements um, right there with the one we're seeing right now for Dogecoin. That's why we have so many meme coins all over coin market cap. There's so many, you can't even count them at this point. Do you still see them, you know, coming out more going forward? That's meme coins. Elon Musk and Doug has done very well in marketing Doug in some ways. You know, at some point uh, in the last bull run, you saw a couple of persons were anticipating that uh, and Dogecoin is going to get to one dollar, and it didn't get to that. In fact, it went so down uh, on Twitter. You, 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 I know you must have seen some videos of some persons crying. I sold my house, I sold my car, and I lost everything. That is what happens when someone that is influential uh, try to market something, and you just hop in. It is not done that way. You lose your money. The name coins that are pumping is just in a way where liquidity is circulating. People that have made money. That have bought Bitcoin for 35,000, 40,000, 50,000. They usually take profit and put it on meme coin. Then it, it, the price moves up. And a, a couple of these retailers uh, that don't understand how the industry works usually up to buy the top. People usually buy the top. In fact, people have started calling some of, uh, some of my assets, even myself inclusive. Can is this the right time to buy? And I usually tell them, I can't give you financial advice. So that you don't lose your money. You don't buy the grain. You buy the red. And you stay the green. Now we're seeing the green pay and green index going up the roof. A whole lot of things are happening. People are used to always telling the noise. This is not how we ought to be. The liquidity is just circulating. We have to be very careful. Stay away from the hype. When the noise is too loud, that is when you have to be wary, as far as Nikon is concerned. I think this will help a lot of people to approach the crypto and meme coin. Uh, crave in a more smart way. For me, I'm not a, a fan of meme coin because it's just garbage in, garbage out, no utility. But some people want to make quick money, they lose money quickly. And definitely we know with the cost of living crisis, some people would want to make quick money, you know, at this time. So I guess Rume's advice is stay away uh, from the meme coins. But before I let you go, Rume, what are you seeing for the second quarter for Bitcoin price action? A lot, if you ask me, uh, these are local palace, too much for Hala for the industry right now. Regulation is too much. You see, the, the, the quality GDP of the U.S. is going to be coming out towards the weekend. Weekends are going to be really hot. This uh, investigation, this uh, sentence is going to come up a few, I think it's already on, uh, in, in the court right now. And if it goes either way, it's going to do some shake. The first week of April is going to be really hot. How often is coming? Uh, we have seen things differently happening in the crypto industry. Uh, we've not seen a pre-housing shakeup. I think we saw something minimal about uh, between 10 to 15 percent, which is not what it used to be. Uh, CZ is also going to be sentenced in April. Uh, you know, a whole lot is going to happen. So if you want to bet, please keep your risk in a minimal way. Uh, there's going to be heightened uh, vol volatility in April, if you ask me. Right, and you also have to control that FOMO if you want to play in this market. Thank you so much, uh, Rume Ophi. It was great having you. Thank you very much, Ladi. Always a pleasure. All right. Let's uh, look at some uh, top gains um, right there in the market. We're seeing Bitcoin holding up 0.83%. Uh, BNB, that's the biggest mover now, 2.09%, $589. Trying to get um, above that $600 um, dollar level. I think that was the previous, around the previous high uh, before now. XRP, 62 cents, 0.39%. Let's look at the top gainers um, this afternoon. We see Bitcoin Cash, $562 up about 14.31%, um, double digit gains uh, with Doge there, the king of meme coins, 9.90%, uh, Pendle um, holding up at $4.25, 7.73%. Um, Let's look at the top losers uh, this afternoon. We see ICP, um, internet computer, $18. Didn't see this price um, coming. This was hovering over um, under $5 for the longest time. Um, big move there, but it's down 5.74% on profit-taking. Phantom also holding at $1.21.
uh, cents, 4.67% uh, um, down. So um, any, that, that's how the market is looking today. It's a, it's a really, really greedy market. And just as Rumi said, you need to be very, very careful in a really hot market like yeah. this one. Well, I think what I like the most about what Rumi said is uh, if you want to take the illegal stance here in Nigeria, the Securities and Exchange Commission is coming for you. Right. <laughs> so yeah. watch, look your, yeah. look behind your, watch your shoulder. Yeah, you, you can't use crypto for money laundering. You can With use the way that. it's looking. Exactly. Thank you so much, Ladi. Thank you. So that's it uh, on the program. Tomorrow is Good Friday. I know you'll be at home, but we'll be here uh, taking you around the world of business. What business can you do on Good Friday? You find out tomorrow. I'm mean, Uni John Mekwa. I'll see you tonight for the Stock Market Report and then tomorrow. Bye-bye.